Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two female servants and his eleven sons and crossed the ford at Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. The man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him, and he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of the hip was touched near the tendon. Morning. Morning. May surprise some of you all to learn that I'm not very good at patiently waiting. <laughs> Hadn't noticed. Not at all. Particularly waiting for God's timing. And I'm really good at getting after it. One of my friends from college told me one time the, the first thing uh, that I learned about you, Mark, is that you get stuff done. And you didn't say stuff, but you understand it. And that's totally true. I get stuff done. I don't like waiting around for God or anybody else. There are things to do, chores to be done, tasks to complete. And by God, I can do it. Anybody relate to that? No, just one, just me and JT. Y'all a bunch of liars. <clears throat> anyway. This, of course, isn't all bad, except interrelational. There are times when we need other people. We have to accept help. I can only do so much. The disappointing truth is, I am and we are finite beings. What's more, we are created to be in community, not to be isolated. But more to my point, we are so determined, when we are so determined to be self-sufficient, we miss opportunities to be useful to God. We don't allow God to work, let alone let him be in charge of our lives. We don't leave any space for his timing or his ways, because we're going to do it by ourselves. I mean, we are frontier folk after all. We are self-sufficient. However, the witness of the Bible says we are to be reliant on God, not ourselves. There's two Proverbs that come to mind quickly. It's trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. A man makes his plans, but it is the Lord who establishes his steps. See, we need to be rid of our self-sufficiency so that God can indeed be Lord of our lives. We might then ask, how do believers stop being so self-sufficient? How do believers stop fighting with God? Today we're going to answer this question as we continue in our series on the patriarchs. And as we turn to the scripture for today, I may have said this at some point in the past, but it bears repeating. And that is one of the things about narrative, which is the style that we are reading through in these scriptures, is that it's episodic, which means that it is relayed in scenes or episodes, and the overarching narrative must be considered as a whole story. So just like modern TV shows, most of them are episode by episode, each episode has its own independent tension, climax, resolution, 
and yet the characters carry on as a part of the whole drama, the whole storyline, continuing from episode to episode. Over the course of several episodes, we see character development, we see the story progress, and over the course of seasons, we see this at a bigger stage. Uh, characters change, come and go, sometimes they even kill characters off. And yet, the story as a whole continues. And usually it is the story of the main character. And so too with biblical narrative, here Jacob being the main character, we have this whole overarching story. The individual episodes then take in one at a time, but we must not remove them from that whole story. And so last week, uh, and really this started the sermon before, which was like two months ago, because we took a little break there, uh, we concluded the period of Jacob's exile, and we can call that season two, Jacob's struggles with Laban, which of course followed season one, Jacob's struggles with Esau and Isaac. Anyway, last week we began to prepare Jacob in his return to Canaan. We saw that Jacob had come to understand that he must face Esau, and that in, in order to move back home and carry on with his life. So he sent messengers to Esau to greet him and to seek his favor. But when the messengers returned, they had bad news. Esau was coming to meet Jacob with 400 men. So naturally, Jacob panics, forgetting all the promises of protection that he has received from God over and over again. And so he sets apart a gift from es for Esau, hoping to buy peace. We concluded with Jacob sending this gift off while remaining with the camp. And perhaps you all will recall that our focus last week was the fact that even though this mess was a result of Jacob's previous actions, he ought to have relied on God for protection and blessing. Instead, he came up with a human backup plan, just in case. And so too, as believers, even when, or perhaps especially, we face difficult situations that are of our own making, we can rely on God for protection and blessing. Now you may have felt that we did not conclude the episode there. We are left with a great big to be continued, to be continued from your perspective, across the screen. And indeed you're right, that is correct. Luckily today, we're not gonna address it at all. Next week, we will see the conclusion of our exciting tension of Esau coming with 400 men to meet Jacob. In the meantime, we have this interlude, which is when Jacob comes face to face with God. And it is really significant in view of the whole story of Jacob. See, he was in exile and now he's returned and we've seen this peace treaty between Jacob and Laban and he's about to enter the promised land. He's about to return home and start really receiving the promises but before he can re-enter, he has this vital meeting with God. And so verse 22 acts as a transition. It explains to us how Jacob ends up all by himself. He had divided his camp, and so now he sends it across the Jabbok in uh, stages. And once everybody else was gone, he finds himself alone. And as he finds himself there alone, he is approached, attacked, even probably isn't too strong of a word by a man. And so we know, all we know about this character is a man. And for the first time, the reader and Jacob, for the first time reader and for Jacob, there's no knowledge of who this man is. This man, whoever he is, wrestles with Jacob until daybreak, a long and arduous match with no decisive or clear winner until the man realizes he cannot overpower Jacob. And so, Jacob then receives a surprise. The man touches him, and his hip is wrenched. Many commentators view this as uh, the dislocation of the hip, which would then tear the sciatic tendon. Now, if you have ever hurt your sciatic nerve, sciatic tendon, you know this hurts a lot. It's like white hot lightning running down your leg. If you haven't, good for you. Yeah, either way, 
Uh, and it may not even have been that. But the point is, whatever this was, uh, it's clear that this man Jacob is wrestling with is supernatural. <laughs> Likely, this is Jacob's first clue that this opponent is no ordinary man. But he must be some supernatural being. Now, the phrase here translated uh, could not overpower him, the not overpower him part, is probably better understood as subdued uh, or perhaps prevail. That is by natural means, of course, because this uh, being in human form, uh, this man that we've now learned is a supernatural being, could have actually squashed Jacob quickly and easily. But he didn't. He was willing to remain within natural means so far up to this point of touching his hip. And then he uses great restraint because instead of smooshing Jacob, he just touches his hip socket and goes no further. So even at that extent, Jacob continues to cling to the man, probably in great pain. I don't know if you've ever tried to wrestle with a dislocated hip. I have not, but I'd imagine it's quite painful. The idea here is that Jacob was not willing to yield, not in this wrestling match. We might say that he was too stubborn to give up. He was determined to come out on top. And even if at this point it is clear, it looks like a blessing rather than a victory. Now, spoiler alert, we know what Jacob learns. This man is a representative, a representation of God. And what is playing out here is the symbolic of the spiritual truth. That is that Jacob will not relent to God. He is determined to do it by his own strength. Even after he's injured, he's clinging on to this man in his own strength. He will not relent. And I want to be clear that uh, this, we come to this conclusion, it's from the context. Right? We are in the middle of the bigger picture episode of these brothers meeting again. And Jacob has just made his human backup plan, dividing his camp into two and sending a gift on to Esau. He's not relying on God. He's not relenting. He is still relying on his own strength, determined to prevail of himself. And so we see this reflected in this wrestling match, which represents not only the present contextual situation of not letting go of this supernatural being, but uh, Jacob's lifelong character. So Jacob has struggled his whole life against God and men. So we hold that thought for a minute. We'll come back to it. But first, our first point. Sometimes God cripples self-sufficient believers. Sometimes God cripples self-sufficient believers. And so here we have this wrestling match. And I want to be clear. Sometimes we use this phrase, we wrestled with God. And we mean something positive by it. Uh, we use Christianese to signify uh, a positive thing. And then Paul tells us we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Right? We should wrestle with our flesh, our calling to holiness, to figuring out who God is, and to understand a perfect, holy, just, and righteous God who is also merciful and gracious. What it looks like to love God with all of ourselves and love our neighbor as ourselves. We should wrestle with all of these things and other things in the scriptures. And so I know I've always looked at this story in the sense of Jacob is doing something positive here. He's wrestling with God. He's wrestling with this man. But as, as I studied for this message, I don't think that's what the narrator is getting at. What the author wants us to take away See, Jacob is fighting with God. Jacob is proudly asserting, no, God, I'm going to do it this way. It's not wrestling in the positive sense uh, that we use it in our Christian movies. And so I hope that you do wrestle with God. I hope that you do come to God's word, and when you find things that you are confused about or uncomfortable with, instead of dismissing it or deciding that you must be right, that you engage with it that you ask questions, that you study, that you pray, that you especially pray and ask the Holy Spirit, that you may work out your own salvation with fear and trouble, that you wrestle with the implications of the various views, 
that you wrestle with God in the sense of being restless in your pursuit of him and of understanding him and of getting more of him, of being persistent in your search for truth. But what we don't want to do is fight with God, to pridefully say, nah, I'm good. I got this one, God. You can sit it out. Of course, we use human means and methods for doing whatever. We're doing good things. We're doing God's will. But that's not the point, right? That's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is self-sufficiency. What we're talking about is saying, no, God, I don't want anything to do with your plan or your purpose or your means. I'm going to do it my way, in my strength, in my sufficiency. See, it fits with this idea of striving or struggling, which we have seen from Jacob through this whole, uh, through the whole story, the whole Jacob cycle. We're trying to make it happen in our own strength, in our own power, in our own way. And so we find ourselves in that position, and God will sometimes cripple us. I hope you understand that I'm using the word cripple as a play on words. I don't mean that he will necessarily reach out and touch our head. But you see what I mean, I hope, that God will frustrate our efforts, that he will impede our progress, that he will delay, or he will out and out stop the results which we want. Sometimes God will cripple the self-sufficient believer. And God blesses the dependent believer. God blesses the dependent believer. The man and Jacob has wrestled all night. And as day is breaking, the man tells Jacob, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And it seems that the supernatural touch, which crippled Jacob, also revealed at least the nature of the man, that he was a supernatural being. And so Jacob is now determined to be blessed. This request provides a clue that the real nature of the man is now dawning on Jacob as day breaks. I can't remember the word for that. There's a literary device in word there. I can't remember the name. The day is breaking and it is dawning on Jacob. This is no ordinary man. I think that the NET study note on verse 26 helps us. It says, Jacob wrestled with a man, thinking him to be a mere man. And on that basis, Jacob was equal to the task. But when it had gone on long enough and the night visitor touched Jacob and crippled him, Jacob's request for a blessing can only mean that he now knew that this opponent was supernatural. And so this passage shows that Jacob stopped fighting and then asked for a blessing. And so we have this renaming. We have the man asks, and then the man asks Jacob his name. This is not because the man didn't know Jacob's name. Obviously, this uh, representation of God knows Jacob's name. The point is to draw Jacob's attention to what is true of himself, what his name meant, specifically in regard to his lifestyle throughout his adult life. In other words, Jacob had to confess his nature. And remember that though we held that thought, we held earlier. But we're back. Jacob's nature. Remember that his name means heel catcher. And as we've seen through this series, Jacob has always been a schemer, a trickster going head-to-head -head with his adversaries, always after the one up and ship. And when the man asks him his name, Jacob is forced to acknowledge the truth which Esau proclaimed all those years earlier, that Jacob is rightly named heel catcher. And yet the man says, not anymore. Now you will be called Israel. Again, the NET study note helps us. Here, Israel means God fights. This name will replace the name Jacob. It will be both a promise and a call for faith. See, in essence, the Lord was saying that Jacob would have victory and receive the promises because God would fight for him. This ought not be new information to Jacob. Uh, and what I find really interesting here is that we don't see any guarantee of Jacob's transformation. See, in fact, as we continue in the story, we'll see that Jacob is not wholly transformed, but in part at least continues sometimes in his old ways. 
Sometimes he acts rightly as God's chosen patriarch, and sometimes he does not. It's kind of like all of us. The point of the renaming illustrates the fact of Jacob's nature, and it is an invitation to him to accept God's blessings on God's terms. It's an invitation to accept God's blessing on God's terms. To stop fighting with God, to stop striving and struggling, but to submit, to relent, and to allow God to work, to bless, to fight on his behalf. Here specifically, to fight on his behalf in this upcoming meeting with Esau. But holistically, in all things. Jacob has been told over and over and over again, indirectly, indirectly, you're the patriarch. God is going to protect you. I am not going to leave you. Would you please figure it out? And yet, just like us, some days yes, some days no. So God blesses the dependent believer. And this is uh, one of those things which I find hard to explain, uh, to articulate clearly, but is obviously true. And let me share one a little more obscure story to illustrate. When I was working uh, at Mesquite Church, which is where I worked before I came here, I was finishing my degree, uh, I had one member of the leadership, uh, a woman who, among other tasks, took care of editing and printing the bulletin. Right? I could not possibly keep this woman happy. It did not matter what I did. It didn't matter how I went about it. There was always something. Mark, you didn't do this. Mark, you did do this. Mark, you made this editing error. Mark, do you know grammar at all? Well, no. I, I'm proficient in three languages. Give me a break. <laughs> so, it went week by week. And eventually, there was quite a bit of tension there, and it finally dawned on me, maybe I should just pray about this and see if God has anything to say. So I don't remember exactly what I prayed, but the point is I did pray and ask God to intervene. And sure enough, that Sunday, when I saw her, she came up to me and gave me a great big hug. I don't really know what happened between her ears, between the time I prayed and Sunday when I saw her, but something happened. As far as I could tell, I hadn't changed anything. I wasn't doing anything different. But just like that, God did something and moved her heart. Can't say that we were best friends after that, but we got along and we did work together well. You see, God fought for me. More better, more better stated, probably stated more clearly or more succinctly or more to the point. God intervened for peace within his body. And the point is, when we become dependent on him, he will bless us. And that blessing might look like fighting for you. It might look like working on a peer or a co-worker or a colleague or a neighbor or a family member's heart. It could really be a zillion different things. But God blesses the dependent believer. So in verse 29, we see the conclusion of this interaction with the man. Jacob asks his name, and the reason uh, isn't given. And therefore, we don't know why Jacob asks. And I mention that because the commentators are all over the map on this. But the point is, if we were supposed to know, the narrator would have told us. Perhaps Jacob wanted verification of what he suspected, or many present-day believers hold, namely that this was a manifestation of God, whether it was the pre-incarnate Christ, or whether it was uh, the angel of the Lord, as a technical term, not really super important. Could have been some other manifestation of Elohim. Whatever. The point is that this was a clear representation of God. And if the narrator wanted us to know more than that, he would have told us. After all, the main things are the plain things. Finally, the man blessed Jacob there. We don't know specifically what this blessing consisted of. Many contend that the blessing is the renaming. I like this idea, though I don't think you can prove it. But as I said, I think the renaming is really an invitation uh, to live according to this calling. To live as God's patriarch. To walk in the ways of uh, one who knows he has God's protection. 
I think that this renaming is an invitation to live into the new name. Which is exactly what happens when somebody accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior. We are invited in to live in this new name. As we are now called by our Savior, Christ the end. And then it is up to us with the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in that truth. And so too Jacob has been invited to walk in this new name. And God blesses, so God blesses the dependent believer. Dependent believers are bold in faith. Dependent believers are bold in faith. And Jacob responds to this event by naming the place Peniel, which means face of God. We might understand it as presence of God. And Jacob says he came face to face with God and survived. Which is a pretty bold statement. However, we should understand survived here uh, means spared. Right? The use, <clears throat> here's something nerdy for you, ready? The use of the passive voice in Hebrew indicates Jacob acknowledges he had no agency in that. Rather, it was God's grace which preserved him. In other words, Jacob is acknowledging he didn't have anything to do with the man not squishing him like a bug. Rather, it was God's grace which restrained the man in teaching this lesson clearly. The point is that Jacob has been shaken by this experience. Indeed, it is an awesome thing to be in the presence of God, to come face to face with him. The narrator doesn't emphasize for the reader what Jacob must have realized, if not directly, at least by this point, that this man was God himself or his supernatural representative. The truth is, at any point, he could have snuffed Jacob's life out, but instead, God stayed him and preserved Jacob's life. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise because Jacob is the chosen patriarch. We would expect nothing different than God's protection of him, even in staying his other servant, this man, or if indeed this is a pre-incarnate Christ, same concept. Uh, we see the, the restraint. And so we have this idea of this gracious God who suffers the foolishness of humankind. He not only spares us, but he blesses us. And if this isn't something that ought to make our faith bold, I don't know what it is. I hope you understand that when I say bold, I don't mean uh, bold before God as an irreverent or audacious or presumptive. I mean that our faith is bold. Our faith is certain. Our faith is such that we know that we know that we know our God. That our God is mighty. Our God is great. Our God is all-powerful. And he is with us. He is watching over us. He is protecting us. And he is fighting for us. And he is blessing us. And it is the result of this bold faith that we would be bold to proclaim the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead, and that whoever believes that should have eternal life. And that all the people around us who don't know that are told that by us. See, it takes us to be bold, to step out, to go out of our comfort zone, to minister to the orphan and the widow, to love our neighbor as ourselves to love using our hands, our dinner tables, our time, to invest meaningfully in our local church financially, with our time and our talents, with our participation in worship services and other events. It is this bold faith that fearlessly sets our hands to the kingdom work which God has placed before us, which God has set apart his body, the church, to do. Now, I love this closing scene, and I think it reflects the understanding that Jacob has, at least in this moment, that he's leaving this event, and though maybe he doesn't always act like it, he has found a new profound understanding of being face-to-face -face with God. Now, we recall that in verse 11, he prayed for deliverance. Save me from my brother Esau, I'm fearful he's going to attack. Jacob prayed. 
And now, as he crosses Penwell, with the sun rising behind him, limping from this uh, event, he heads back to the camp of his family and possessions. And we see that he was delivered. He was in the same word, delivered. He was spared from this encounter with the Lord and will surely be delivered from Esau. So, by way of application, stop fighting with God. How, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Here's a few quick thoughts. Pray. First and foremost, pray. You are not going to hear God's voice if you are not talking to God and listening to God. It is also through prayer uh, which God gives us his peace uh, and, uh, and gives clarity. Look for what God is doing. When we stop and we are uh, get out of our own way, we are able to see what God has been doing around us. Sometimes that's not great because we see what we have been doing is not what God wants us to be doing or what God is doing. Be patient. That's self-explanatory. Continue to walk with it. I think sometimes we get in our head, if I'm not moving forward, then I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs and that's not productive. Uh, that's, not, that's not mutually exclusive. We can be in one area waiting on the Lord to move and yet holistically continuing to move forward and draw near to him. Sometimes we come to the end of ourselves. Usually when we come to the end of ourselves is when we finally start praying. And when we do that, that waiting isn't the useless just sitting here on a bump type of waiting. That is the, I'm waiting patiently to see what God does in order to know what my next step in this particular area needs to be. Today, we return to our series on the patriarchs. We answered the question, how do believers stop fighting with God? And we saw God will cripple self-sufficient believers, that he blesses dependent believers, and dependent believers are bold in their faith. In short, to become bold in our faith, believers must be dependent on God. To become bold in our faith, believers must be dependent on God. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your servant, Jacob. Thank you for the invitation to walk in a new name, Christian. Lord, help us to forsake our self-sufficiency, but to be dependent on you. And even as we know we do use human means, we do use our efforts, we do use our work, to let all of those things be as if unto you, and that we might clearly hear the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and that we might not be so sufficient, but rather that we would be out of the way, that we would be blessed and we would be bold in our faith. Use us for your glory, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name.